when I first went to see John Fuang, it didn't take me long to pick up the fact that he had some psychic powers. The ability to read minds was primary among them. And he would tell stories about a John Lee's powers. This kept up for a couple of days, and then he probably realized that I was getting too interested in that aspect of the practice. And so one night he said, you know, all these things about the different powers that come with meditation, they're just games. What the practice is really about is purifying the heart. And the statement stuck with me for a long time. Because the basic assumption is the Buddha is not asking you to come with pure motives. Why well, that your heart already be pure? The assumption is that there's a lot of impurity in there, and he wants to teach you anyhow. He taught the end of suffering for all beings, and he didn't ask them ahead of time, is your motive for coming here pure, or the suffering you're suffering from? Is it something you deserved? I mean, he could have said that based on your past karma you deserve to suffer, so he could just leave you there. But he never said that. In fact, the question of people deserving to suffer or not deserving to suffer, or people deserving to learn the path or not, that never came up. The basic issue was, there's, was there some desire someplace in your heart that wanted to be done with the suffering that you're creating for yourself? In the beginning, of course, that desire may not even be dominant. You may have other conflicting desires. But the Buddha would take you on as a student anyhow. All he asked, he says, is one, that you be observant, and two, that you be truthful. Nothing about being pure from the beginning. Which means that all of us come here with mixed motives, and that's to be expected. It's just you want to be truthful about when you act on a particular motive, what are the results? And what are you actually doing? The Buddha wants you to look at that. This is why meditation is based on the primary topic of meditation is based on the breath. You're right here where the mind and the body meet. The fact that the mind can make the body move has to go through the breath. The fact that things happening in the body can get into the mind has to go through the breath. So you're right at the crossroads to look at your body, look at your mind, and to see what's going on. When an intention comes up in the present moment, being with the breath is a really good place to be, to watch it. And you try to develop a sense of well-being, of belonging here in the present moment. Because you're going to see some things coming up in the mind that you're not proud of. But that's to be expected. I'm going to make a big deal about acceptance in some schools of Buddhism. And sometimes they make way too much of it. But there is one thing you have to accept. When something's coming up in the mind, you have to accept the fact that it's there. And then the next question is, what do you do with it? That's where the Buddha comes in to help. If you really want to put it into suffering, he gives you instructions on how to deal with lust, anger, spite, jealousy, all the things in the mind that we're not necessarily proud of, but part of the mind likes. And part of the mind is really into one with, and there's a part of the mind that doesn't want to let go. And so you see it coming in sometimes and sabotaging your meditation. And John Mahabhu talks about this. He says at the beginning of his practice he'd get the mind quiet, and then it was almost a, a rhythm or a timetable where you could expect that things would start falling apart. His desire to practice, the results of the practice would begin to spiral downward hit rock bottom, and then he'd have to start all over again. So 
So even he had to go through periods like that. His solution was simply to sit down and practice and say, I don't care what the results are. I'm going to do the practice. His practice was bhutto, but you could do the same with the breath. And the part of the mind that says your meditation is off, you'd be better off doing something else. You don't you just don't listen to that. You try to nurture that desire deep inside that says, I want to stop suffering. And you protect that like a little tiny flame. As the Buddha said, simply the, the desire to want to be skillful is in and of itself a skillful desire. And the more you can act on it, the better. The more it becomes a tendency of the mind. In his terms, it bends the mind in the right direction. The intentions that you act on are the ones that bend the mind. So even though it may be a struggle, when the skillful desire has the last word, that's that's what's going to bend the mind in a skillful direction. And you may have this sense that it's like turning a large ship. You know, ships can't just turn around on a dime. They have to make a, make a huge circle before they can get back in the other direction. But every little bit helps. And then, of course, there will be an unskillful voice in the mind that says, these little efforts, they don't amount to anything, and it's pretty pitiful, you might as well give up. You learn not to listen to that. Remind yourself of that statement. Even the desire to be skillful is skillful in and of itself. So keep that desire going. Where you're really done in is when you have no desire to be skillful at all. So at the very least, nurture that desire. I want to be skillful. I want to act in ways that are not harmful. And so even when you are acting in ways that are not harmful, and the mind has mixed motives or mixed intentions, part of it is objecting, that's perfectly fine. It's part of the pra practice, part of the path. There was a German poet and philosopher, Schiller, one, who one time made that distinction between acts that are done with grace and acts that are done with dignity. Grace is when you feel inclined to do something skillful, and there doesn't seem to be anything in the mind getting in the way. And so it becomes very easy to do what's skillful. And then acts done with dignity, he said, are the ones where Part of the mind wants to do something skillful, and part of the mind wants to do something unskillful, and there's a battle. But the skillful side finally wins out. And so this is a practice that we do beginning with dignity, and then eventually it evolves to grace, where the mind really is pure. But there will be setbacks along the way that are to be expected. You've got to learn how to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and just get back on the path. And don't listen to the discouraging voices inside, especially the ones that say, well, your meditation used to be a lot better and now it's horrible. See what happens to good meditation? It just turns into nothing, so you might as well not even try. Well, you know what the problem was, that you weren't nurturing it consistently enough. And so you start all over again. You say, this time I'm going to nurture it. It's like having planted a lot of trees that you forget to water. It doesn't mean that when you plant this tree, you're going to forget, it, forget to water it. This time around, you're going to water it. A little bit of water here, water there, and the tree will grow. And all those other little dead trees you've seen in the past, you don't have to think about them, except as a warning. You've got to keep watering your tree. Keep nurturing that little desire. I want to be skillful. I want to stop causing myself unnecessary suffering. This is called heedfulness, realizing that your actions really do matter, and they're going to make the difference between whether you suffer or not. This heedfulness is based on conviction, because there are a lot of voices out there say that your actions don't matter, you don't have any free choice anyhow. 
You know, people will even believe that their DNA forces them to do things, or the laws of physics force them to do things. They have no freedom. Some people like that thought. But you see where it leads. It just leads to more suffering. And the Buddha says there's a way out. It starts with the assumption your actions do make a difference. And the desire to do something skillful is skillful in and of itself. As the Buddha said, all things are rooted in desire. That's the desire you want to foster. So that it does grow. You keep watering it bit by bit by bit until it begins to take hold. Even then you have to protect it. And this principle holds all the way through the path. I mean, think about those noble disciples. Stream enterers still have lust. Non-returners non still have conceit. It's only when you get to be an arahant that your mind is totally pure. So you'll be de dealing with a mixed pure and impure mind, or a mind of mixed pure and impure intentions all the way along. The question is, which are you going to act on? Starting with the stream enter, the, the intention always is to act on the skillful intention. Prior to that time, there's still going to be part of the mind that's going to have some doubts. Did the Buddha really know what he's talking about? Is this just an Indian religion or just for Asians? Or is this a bunch of delusions? There will be that voice in the mind. And you've got to learn how to live with it, but not let it take over. Even when you're confident that that voice will never come back, you've got to be careful. But that's what heedfulness is for, and so that you will take care in the midst of all the other intentions that are sloshing around in the mind. Make sure there is at least that little voice saying that I want to, I want to be skillful. I want to act in a skillful way. And it's that desire, when you nurture it, that will lead to purity. The purity of heart, where your happiness is totally skillful. And it doesn't need to be nurtured anymore. There does come a point where the mind is totally pure, with no germs that would make it impure again. So this is not an endless struggle. This is what the Buddha and the, no, the great noble disciples have already guaranteed for us all along. And simply for us. To decide that we're going to heed their message. But it's a message they've been giving us out of compassion for a long time. And they give it for everybody. One of the things I noticed when I went to Thailand and started practicing the forest tradition, I met a lot of people who were coming to the practice from having lived on the very edge of the law or outside the edge of the law. More people of that sort than I'd ever met ever before. Which made me realize this is a practice for everybody. You know the story of Angulimala. He'd killed all those people, and he could still become an arahant. It requires determination. Where does determination come from? Not simply force of will. Oh, that does play. An important role, but it also comes from simp the simple realizing, okay, I, I've been suffering and I really can't blame anybody else. Here's some help. The Buddha is offering a helping hand.
and it's up for me to take it. And the realization that he's offering that hand, regardless of what your past karma has been, or how mixed your motives are for taking his help. But if you're observant and truthful, he's got a path that allows you to sort things out inside. So even an unpure mind or an impure mind can find purity. And at that thought, even your impure mind can take heart. 